Hey everybody, welcome to uh, duck class. This is part one. We're using these whole ducks from Duck Char. We're actually gonna butcher the whole thing today. I've got Chef uh, Dalton Jones with us. So uh, again, my name's Dalton. I more or less um, learned to really butcher at my time at Husk Nashville, where we were doing a lot of primals, whole birds, um, and whole pigs. Well, half pigs, I should say. So I used to go through about 100 to 120 chickens a week and then ducks whenever we had those on special we'd be doing a bunch of them so this is something that i became very familiar with and it's a skill that i think is nice to know that not a lot of people really learn at home so this is a uh, yeah this is for you guys this is just to give you something to be able to look forward to impress your friends and really utilize a whole animal and not have to just buy everything pre-made and pre-cut and really kind of learn how to appreciate the whole thing. So the first thing I kind of wanted to just touch on real quick is some knives. So if you have a knife like this, kind of your classic style chef's knife, this is nice with the point. You want to be able to kind of get into some of those joints and things. So this is definitely what most people are going to have on hand. It's something that works perfectly fine for this. The other would just be, this is kind of my utility knife. This is a little bit harder to use for the duck because it has this belly here, which lends itself a little bit more to the kind of rock and slice and not so much the pinpointed um, butchery for the duck. So if you have kind of between these two styles, I would go for the little bit thinner, longer, finer point on the chef's knife. Something that you're really going to want for duck, it helps with chicken a lot too, is just some shears. These are just my regular old kitchen shears. It's nothing fancy, but it'll get the job done that we need to get done. The next thing would be, if you have a smaller knife like this, some people are a little bit more comfortable doing the detail work with a smaller blade. So something like this that's really, really rigid is not really ideal because you can't get around some of the, the breastplate into the joints, things like that. If you have something like this, this is your sort of classic little butcher utility knife. This thing you can see really crazy flex on this. This is wonderful. Um, I got this for 20 bucks. So Nexus, good brand if you want some cheap, pretty nice, um, just sort of utility house knives. You don't want to spend uh, a ton of money on the Jeff, Japanese stuff. For that sure. smaller knife, would you go more with like a paring knife or a boning knife? They're both kind of flexible. Definitely go, I like to go boning. Paring knife, I feel like you just kind of run out of blade real estate which I'd always rather have a little bit more blade than I need than had less. So when I was in culinary school, for example, they taught us how to break down an entire pig with this. And I still kind of adhere to that philosophy. I don't like using saws and things like that. If you find the joints, you can get through an entire animal with just one of these. This though, if you are feeling like getting into some of this kind of home stuff or you just want a cool knife, this is what's called a Hanasuki. So I've literally bought this just for chicken. So you see it's got a really sharp taper up here, nice thick spine. Even though it's not flexible, it comes to a really fine point here and it works very, very nice for this kind of thing. The biggest difference you'll notice is there's no bevel on this side. It's what's called a single bevel. So you sharpen the entirety of the blade on one end and then just take that burr off. So this is only good for soft things. If you try to cut a carrot with this, because it all bevels in one direction, you'll cut the carrot and you'll just, you'll shear off. Potatoes, shear off. So it needs to be something soft, like meat, is kind of the only good use for these. <laughs> just because it's my favorite, this is what I'm gonna be using today. So these guys, we'll kind of just put away for the moment so they're not over here collecting dust. with the exception of our scissors, obviously. And we're gonna get into it. So, this duck, one of the biggest sort of pro tips I can give you is if you're gonna be butchering an animal um, of any kind, really, and you have the space in your fridge, leave it on a resting rack the day before. So let it totally thaw out. You don't wanna have you know ice crystals in the cavity. It just becomes slippery and cold. It starts to hurt your hands over time you're gonna to wanna to put this um, on a resting rack at least for a few hours. But if you can do it overnight, it's awesome. You can't see in my pan here, but there's quite a bit of um, 
liquid that kind of just drains off. I haven't salted it or anything, but now it's, it's nice and dry and it's much, much easier to manipulate, much easier to keep a grip on, which if, uh, ultimately keeps you a little safer. So and is that just because it's got so much fat that it's so slippery? It's a little bit of that. It's also just what I like to call factory brine. It's all the juices that just kind of come out of the meat as it sits in the bags. And it's just when it gets on the fat, it's kind of got nowhere to go. And then it just becomes a slippery mess. But where I kind of discovered this was um, a farm that we were using in Nashville called Field of Dreams would actually hang their chickens and hang their ducks. They hung their chickens for a couple days um, and it really just kind of desiccated everything out and it made handling them an absolute dream. Whereas if you're getting, getting something in a vacuum seal bag, which is 99.9% .9 of the time what you're going to get if you're in an American market at least, um, it's just moist and it's slippery. You know, it's like dealing with anything wet is just going to be a little bit more difficult. So this is a, a great way to just give yourself the best chances possible from the get-go. So always save the fat, I would say. You're gonna have this big flap that comes off the back here, a little bit more dramatic than what you're gonna find in a chicken. Obviously duck just have more fat in general. So there's nothing here that's really gonna be use, worth using for any kind of cook except to render out. So we'll just take this off. Oh, I see. It's kind of in the cavity and you just need to pull it out. Right, it'll kind of come out. It's just like if you find you know, organ meats in one of your um, chickens that you buy, they always tend to stuff some stuff in the cavity. Yeah, I was like, well, mine didn't have that. And then here it is. <laughs> yeah, and it might not always. Um, this is a very big, this is, this is a really nice big duck. Um, one thing that we're gonna find out here is that there is the entire neck still in this thing, which is awesome to have because Really, neck on any kind of bird is the darkest meat on the bird and arguably the tastiest. Some people just don't like eating the neck, but that was always a Thanksgiving day treat for my dad and I. We would clean out the turkey, get the neck, gizzards, liver, heart, all that, um, kind of rolling in a stock, and then eat those in the middle of the day when we were getting hungry, smelling the turkey roasting. So you're also gonna find a couple of these little bones that are coming off the end here. This will change a little bit depending on the butching, uh, the butchery. But if you have a little bone that's kind of coming off along the thigh here, that's just a little plate that you're not gonna need to have. So this one's broken. I'm just gonna kind of pull that out just in the meantime to kind of clear up a little bit of space here. And that's this little bone that was pretty close to that piece of fat we just cut off on both sides. Exactly. There's one on each side and it's just this little, there's a joint there and you can kind of just twist it and pull it off. It's just not gonna serve you any purpose. It's something that'll get in the way a little bit in the future. If you really, really wanna hold on to these bones, feel free to. Um, we'll hold on to the carcass to make stock and things like that. Duck makes really awesome tonkatsu ramen. Anything that you could use pork or beef in, you can really use duck. You're also gonna find just a little bit of this kind of accessory fat, this kind of globular stuff. Most of this you can kind of just pull out with your hands. Very Jacques Pepin. That guy can take down a whole chicken with just his hands. So those little pieces that you can just kind of pull out of the way. It just gives you a little bit of a, you're just decluttering, you know? All right, so. Now we're gonna kind of look into the cavity here. There's gonna be little remnants of organs, bits of fat, things like that. Any of this stuff, this looks like, you know, probably part of the liver that kind of just got sort of um, left behind or maybe they were packaging. Um, a little bit of it just kind of snuck its way in there. It's not really important for us to save. Oh, another thing that I should have touched on earlier actually is Kind of one thing that you'll see that sets butchers apart from people who aren't used to butchering is keeping one of your hands clean. So whatever knife uh, hand you're using, if you can, try to keep that out of contact with the meat and then it just gives you a hand that you have for other things without having to go wash your hands every five seconds. I'm gonna so wash to my kinda... hands and reset and try to stick to that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Probably should have let off with that little piece of information. Um, the other thing that will 
help with if you're keeping one of your hands clean is that it doesn't become greasy from the fat or slippery from whatever moisture is left in there and you have a really nice grip on your knife. Yeah, that was the one thing I was curious about is like how how am I going to keep this knife from slipping out of my hand? But I guess it's right. more, even if you're right hand dominant with your knife is in, try to use your mm -hmm. left hand for coming in contact exactly. with the bird. <laughs> and that kind of stuff you just kind of get a feel for over time where you become, your left hand gets a little bit more independent or your right hand, depending on whatever hand you have dominant. Um, and that's just from doing hundreds and hundreds of chickens. So I just kind of flipped her around. Now we'll grab this neck and you can kind of just roll it out. And so you can use your blade here a little bit to just kind of push the flat side against the breast and it'll actually, you can hold the bird in place that way. So then we'll go ahead and flip this over. Ducks obviously have much longer necks than chickens, so you get quite a bit of meat on one of these. The uh, joints, the joints in the neck can get a little troublesome because they're funky. You can't just go straight through a neck joint. But what you can do is find right here at the base, anytime you need to find a joint, feel free to just kind of pinch on the meat a little bit and you'll be able to feel that divot in between two bones. So when you feel a little divot in between two hard places, it's a pretty good bet there's a joint there. So find that divot, come in one side, kind of come around. This is where you're giving it like one of those, you know, Italian neckties or whatever they call them. Then you come down the other side here, same thing, kind of find that joint space. Um, vertebrae articulate in a really interesting way. So it's not like going through um, a regular joint. They kind of interconnect in this weird way. So once you get that meat loosened up on either side, it's often easier to just give it a couple twists and it'll actually separate that joint. Man, I wanna use my right hand so bad, but I'm trying not to. <laughs> it takes a little practice for sure. This kind of stuff you can definitely leave. I'm just a weirdo. And anytime I can clean up a little bit of this stuff, I will just because I like having everything as clean as possible. Right. So well, now you'll be able um, to see. No, no shame to you butchering along if you have to use your right hand like I do. You're just going to have to wash and dry your hands more. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole thing, you know. And it just takes a little bit of practice. And if I come in across like a really difficult joint or something or something that's heavy and I just can't get around it with one hand, I'm definitely recruiting the other hand in there. And definitely as you're, one... as you're butchering along with us, Feel free to pause if needed. I definitely don't want anyone with slippery hands to have an accident with your knife. So just, uh, you Absolutely. know, there's no rush here. This is just day one, all the cooking's tomorrow. So just be safe, wash your hands, dry your hands. <laughs> definitely. And don't, don't touch a duck and then rub your eyes. I don't know, I guess I wouldn't do that with any meat. I think an interesting thing you'll see here is um, wing tips on ducks are often just not even included. The wingtips on duck get very sharp and they have a propensity to rupture whatever bag you put them in. So they'll oftentimes oh. just cut those off. They make really nice additions for stocks and things because there's some pretty good surface area with not a lot of fat, just some good skin. And if you roast them really hard, you can get some awesome flavor um, for your stocks. But duck wings are more or less inedible. They're, they just don't have anything to them like chicken wings you know and they're used much more because they're a they're a, not a flightless bird so they tend to get a little tough and the meats on there's a little bit scant all right so now we're kind of getting into the bulk of things there's a couple different ways to approach this you can either get into the breasts first take those breasts off and then you're basically just dealing with the breastplate rib cage and now you have your legs and thighs on there I like to use the weight of the breast to leverage my legs and thighs off. So I always go for legs and thighs first because I think it's a little easier to kind of manipulate. One thing you can do though, we'll take these wings off just to get these out of the way. So if you pull the wing open, you'll find this little flap of skin here. Kind of looks like this flap here in between your thumb and finger. That is going to be a little bit arbitrary because we're not really using these. So staying as close to the back of the bird as possible. You can kind of just start to sever that little 
flap there and come down, come in, and then you'll start exposing this joint. So you'll kind of come in this way towards the top of this V here, just like that. Oh, I think I already now like this... popped part of it off, honestly. I think I found the joint. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And the joints sometimes in processing, they'll get a little loose or kind of um, broken. So then once you find that joint, you'll usually find like a little capsule around it. It's very easy to kind of get in here with the tip of your knife and start excavating like this, um, which helps a lot. But you'll find that little ball joint there, come in, excavate a little bit, and then this is where you're gonna start to kind of pay attention. So once you're on this side, everything on the other side of this joint, this is the underside of the bird, correct? So if you flip it over, everything on the opposing side of this joint is starting to get into the breast. So in so as the, close to the ball, the, the breast side of the ball joint as possible, I wanna keep exactly. that meat. Yeah, so you'll wanna keep most of it on the carcass. So you'll find this ball, roll it off, kind of come in and keep it really close to the joint of the wing. I'm doing right there, and then come off. So now this stuff right here, this is looking from the underside of the duck. Right here, this is all breast meat. So if you flip it over, you'll see the breast right here. And our wing just came on from the underside of that. So that's really just depends on how much breast you're trying to preserve. You'll see this a lot in chicken where they take the whole breast off and leave that wing on. That's called an airline cut. But like I said, with ducks, it's not too edible. So you'll have something like this, which is something that you can either roast um, and then use to flavor things. I will go ahead and just usually throw these into the confit. And it's more just to have some kind of Scooby snacks later on. Not because you're going to be able to do too much with it, culinarily speaking. It's a little bit funky texture. This is just for when I pull the confit out and I'm hungry and I don't want to get into eating all the good stuff. This is the thing that will tie me over and keep me from just demolishing the uh, thighs and drumsticks. So then one more time, kind of from the other side here. Pull in. Take this flap of skin down. Hook in towards the breast where that V is. And this is why I like to leave the, the breasts and stuff on for a long period of time is I can pick this whole chick or this whole duck up by this wing. And now if you're ever struggling to find a joint, you can let the weight of the bird open that joint up for you. See? And this one you can kind of pop out a little bit. Find that joint right there. Change my angle here just a bit. Come around, staying as close to that wing as possible. And there you go. You can do that much prettier with chickens when you're actually trying to keep the wings for something. Yeah, I think I had beginner's luck with the first one. I, I definitely got it right the first time. <laughs> so joints are interesting because joints aren't always easy to find. In it's Sometimes the joint on one side is more obvious than the joint on the other. I'm sure there's some biological aspects behind that. Um, there's, this you know, there's die hard. A, a right winged or left winged bird. <laughs> right. And there's a lot of people like that that claim, um, for example, a lot of folks that do barbecues, brisket, they claim that they always try to buy the right hand brisket. You can tell by the way it's um, shaped if it was it came off the right hand side of the cow or the left hand side of the cow. Because the theory is, is that like 90% of cows stand up using their right side first. And so it develops that brisket more than the left. But they don't really have any good science to back that up. So now you kind of have these little flaps of uh, fat back here, which um, you can leave, you can take to render out whatever you want to do. Duck fat is wonderful to render out, especially because it's expensive to buy in stores. So if you're going to go through the trouble of getting a duck, you might as well just get something you can render out and save yourself a little bit of money. Makes really, really wonderful chips, fries, things like that. It fries nice. It's a little so bit more you, saturated. Are you removing that fat from this bird or are you leaving it on right now? We can just, it doesn't matter. You can take it off now. You can leave it on. Um, 
Sometimes it's a little easier once you get your big muscles out of there to then go back and clean that fat off of the carcass because you don't want to keep all that fat on the bones whenever you're going to make stock or you'll just get super fatty stock and the fat is more or less wasted at that point. So I like to go ahead and just... Sometimes it's it kind of depends on what mood I'm in. If I'm feeling a little bit more particular, I'll kind of go in here and pick out all these weird little pieces. And if not, I won't. And it really doesn't affect it either way. Um, some people, I'm sure, would have some diehard reason why you have to take all the fat off first or vice versa. But, I mean, it's... You can be a little loosey-goosey or a little loosey-ducky with things here. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and go into one of these um, legs. It's interesting because when you're doing a bird, since you're going on two sides, you have to change your technique a little bit on each side because you're taking something off the left versus taking something off the right. So I've always found it easier to take the, well, it'd be this duck's right leg. But once you flip it over, starting from the left-hand side, I've always found it easier to take that leg first. So what I'll do is come down here, find right here where the rib cage kind of meets the thigh. You'll have this big kind of pocket of fat right here. What you're going to do is hold the duck up, come down along the ribs here. And so if you stay under the ribs, you're not going to get into the breast at all. You'll find a couple little bones and things in there. You can kind of just ignore them or cut right underneath them. So now what we've done is opened up this whole side here, just like that. Come in, following those ribs. Come all the way, all the way in, following this rib here. See how that's kind of nice and clean, almost like if you're filleting a piece of fish. Once you get it down to here, there's going to be a joint right up here along the spine. You can push in and kind of pull that and you can actually pop that joint just a little bit. And you've only and made that, that one cut like down the rib. Just right? that one cut right here. So okay. start in this little nook here, come all the way across, down the ribs. And so this is when these little bones here, you're not going to find this so much in a chicken. At least it won't be nearly as developed. This sort of um, plate from the hips. But if it helps, you can always kind of come in here and just shave that just a little bit. And that'll really help you kind of open that thigh up. But now you're going to have to find the joint like right in here. And this is a little bit more difficult on a duck than it is on a chicken. Another thing you can do is separate this whole thing from the actual um, rib cage, That's which what I was you can do with I'm kind of, I'm kind of on the path where I think I could just take off both legs at once. Yeah, that's just so let's, my, uh, my beginner's intuition. Right. So we can actually go down that route, and I'll show you. It might be a little bit easier for some folks to kind of break it down that way. So we're going to make the exact same cut right here on the other side, kind of coming back into meeting at that same V. Right there, just along the ribs. So this is where it can get like a little bit brutal. Kind of depends on how comfortable you are just, you know, working with animals. You would grab it here and roll it back. Then you basically have two pieces of rib here and the spine sort of holding it all intact. And this is where you're getting into the spinal joint again. Um, so obviously just a little bit hard to do. But you can give this, literally just give it a rotation, just kind of like that. And then find the inside of that joint, sever all those little ligaments. And once you kind of actually start doing this and you get your knife in there, you'll see what I'm talking about by the weird, those joints being oddly shaped. Let me know if you got the... Uh, uh, separation I mean, kind know, of like that. I got something going on here. Yeah. So now you'll kind of have the two, the two legs with the hip inside here. Um, some of the spine still kind of attached in between. And then you'll have this separate breast. Now, if you wanted to, what a lot of people will do is you can just basically take scissors, cut right across here all the way around. And then you'll have both pieces of the breast on the rib cage. 
and oftentimes people will roast it on the rib cage because the bone underneath helps to keep the meat from drying out and you can really kind of render off that fat cap before that happens and is that the also crown? Just, um i think that's been a name for it um i always just called it like cage in <laughs> you know so, so when we were going through the legs, ideally I was leaving the ribs behind with the breasts. Yeah. So if you like look at it, um, flip the breast over, you'll have kind of like a cylinder, like a round tube where it's still connected all the way across. And then on the back, you'll kind of have these. And I'm just going to show him here, kind of okay. translate this a little bit. Okay. And then yeah, this I got like a... I probably took two ribs with me on one leg and four on the other. <laughs> yeah, which is totally fine because the ribs are something that we're going to get rid of anyway. Okay. So now we're kind of holding this right here. Those same bones that we found on the inside, they make kind of a V that goes into a point and faces towards the breast. That's... So the reason that there's all this space and capacity in there is because of the way that lungs are designed on birds, um, especially birds of flight. They have to take in an incredible amount of oxygen to fly because it's very energetically expensive. And so that's why there's all of this space here in these little bones in cartilage. It allows a ton of flex for them to not only kind of beat their wings, but also to exchange oxygen because their lungs are working over time compared to us. So now where these bones here are kind of forming a V that's facing towards the spine, which would have been facing towards the breasts, we're gonna kind of just come in there and cut along those bones, trying to keep as much of the meat as possible, still facing the thighs and legs. And then right in here, about two thirds of the way up, from this V towards the spine, you'll find that joint. So if you were to lay this down on the table like this and put your hands kind of over top of the leg here, you'll notice you can pop, you can push that over. And that's sort of what we were gonna do um, earlier, but started to come loose. So if you grab it like that and pop it over, you'll actually pull that socket out and then you'll be able to kind of see hopefully an exposed hip socket. All right, do you right mind if we do a quick recap? Um, sure. So it's this this little V-bone here. We're making a cut as close as we can along it. Exactly. Okay. And then after we do that is when we try to pop it. Yeah, and then if you just flip it over, like we are holding it sort of like this and flip it over, you can kind of grab that and roll it up. And that's when you'll pop the joint out of the... You're basically... Pushing, applying pressure from the skin side to push that joint out of the meat side. I'm gonna wash real quick. that joint kind of exposed for you yeah okay i got them both popped sweet so then once you do that just kind of cut along this v go through that joint and just leave you'll kind of create this odd angle on the leg and thigh where you now have sort of a point so if you place it down it looks a little bit like a diamond with a leg sticking out of it is that just like if you followed that V, that's the point from that? Exactly. It'll kind of taper off on the side. And it's always better with the thighs to just keep as much of that meat on there as possible. Even if it's not, even if it doesn't come off the, the bird looking exactly like what you're expecting, you can always do some more trim work later. It's better to just take as much off of the bones as possible. And so you'll see here, pretty clean along those bones, this little V um, that's still intact here. And that's yeah, gonna I'd make say, great stock. I'd say you must have done this professionally before. 
It's tough. <laughs> duck is one of the most frustrating things to do. Um, even when I first started butchering duck, I'd been butchering chickens for a very long time. The duck really did a number on me. It's much more difficult. I'm going to wash real quick. Is it because of all the fat or is there a different reason you think? There's actually some physiological differences that make it much more intense. Um, the bones are larger, the ligaments are stronger because they are a bird that flies. The bone structure is just a little bit different than chickens. They have some extra support kind of around that rib cage, which is where those little sort of leaf bones come out. Well, Chef, I mean, first try, I don't think I left too much behind. There's definitely meat That's on there, but, but looking I'm pretty happy. nice. I'm happy. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I'm just gonna throw a glove on this hand real quick. I got this knife shave sharp, and I just barely nicked the top of my uh, knuckle there. All right, so. This goes to show this kind of stuff can happen no matter how long you've been doing this stuff. Okay, so, Chef, so we've got I our... just took, yeah, I just took my legs off of the, the V awesome. shape. You haven't done anything so after that, right? I have not. So we've got these tons of good meat and fat on there. Um, for now, I'm just going to set these aside, and we can always pretty them up uh, later. But I like to just go ahead and get the entire thing sort of broken down into those whole muscles first. So now we've got our breast if we did a good job right around where we took those wings off we're going to still have a ton of meat um, if you do the wings where you're not paying attention to kind of cutting towards the wing you'll cut this out right here which is just really really tasty good breast meat so now that we have this this actually makes it a little bit easier for folks and it's just a little bit gruesome but if you just push right down on top you kind of break those ribs a little bit, but it'll give you a nice flat surface to work with. It doesn't rock around as much on you. So right. first things first, right in the middle of this cavity where we cut the neck out you'll, is where your wishbone is. So as far as butchering off of this, there's two sort of schools of thought. One is that you can take the wishbone out up front. The other is that you can just take everything and leave the wishbone on the carcass. Kind of depends on what you're going to be doing with it. So um, with ducks, the wishbone here is pretty solid. So I generally will tend to leave that in. Um, so I'll just kind of go on this side here and I'll show you exactly how to take these off. So you'll find the breastplate here. Just start up at the top, just barely to one side and just start to kind of make a couple cuts. This is where it's a good time to kind of use the tip of your knife. So I've got my breastplate there. You can actually see it kind of exposed now here in the center. You'll start on one side and then keeping as close to that breastplate as possible, just make a few long concentric cuts down and then you'll hear that sound that <laughs> of scraping against the bottom of those, uh, that breastplate and those ribs. That means you've made it all the way down. Now, if you look at this one side, you can kind of open it up and see you have separated it from the um, breastplate itself. Then you'll come here to the front of the duck. You'll kind of cut and you'll feel that wishbone there in the front. You're gonna turn and just barely run your knife down along that wishbone. And the wishbone kind of turns inside a little bit. So you're gonna kind of be out and down a little bit to try and cut it away from that wishbone. If you just cut at a flat angle on the wishbone, you'll actually cut into the breast a little bit. But if you come sort of down at it, you'll preserve still even more of that breast on there. So that's what the whole thing is. The whole point of whole animal butchery is just keep as much of the muscle intact as possible. So, now we've separated it from the breastplate here. We've separated it from the wishbone. You can pop the little membrane there in the wishbone and then you'll find a joint right down there. You can cut that off, but that'll bring some of the bone with it. So we'll kind of ignore that. 
So come all the way down and around where we were pulling that wing out from. And then you can fold it back just a little bit. Let's kind of see there. You can now kind of peel it away from the breast or from that uh, breast plate. So now you'll want to kind of roll this muscle out. And this is actually a fun, a fun part. You don't even have to use your knife to get it off of this. Basically, this is part of the sternum. It's this big flat bone right at the bottom of the breast. You can actually use your thumb and kind of just push it away as long as you're putting pressure down on that bone. You can actually use your thumb to just push the meat away from that, which I think is kind of fun. You're oh, not yeah. wasting any see, meat that way. I can see the part I left behind on my initial cut down the uh, spine. Mm -hmm. But yeah, now I'm just able to pull it. <laughs> yeah, now it can kind of peel away. Once you get to the edge of that breastplate, we'll switch back to the knife just because we're going to have some kind of like meat on meat contact. We have it opened up here. We'll again, we'll take this knife, angle it in just a little bit once we get past this bone. And that's where we'll kind of come and you're getting into the rib area and a little bit of the kind of shystier stuff. And then you're basically just going to keep peeling that and cutting as close to the bones as possible, following the angle of the bones all the way down. And then you can kind of follow underneath here. And you should kind of be able to just peel that whole breast off with a little bit of extra fat underneath. And so you can see right there where that transition between the breastplate and the ribs, there's just a tiny bit of meat left, but that's nothing too crazy. Yeah, I'd say I kind of left behind the tender line if the duck has one. <laughs> So they do, it's just really small, but yeah, they do have a tenderloin. It's got that, um, you know, nice little sharp, it kind of tapers to a point there. And then you have that tendon that runs right up the tenderloin. So now we have this underside, not super duper pretty. We got a little bit of connective tissue that we can take out, but hopefully what we did was just get all of the meat off. Cause now we can always go back and do that trimming afterwards. So then we'll go to the second uh, Chef, before we move on, you want to give yes, me sir. some feedback on, on the first half? You can check out the Yeah. Computer. That's looking, yeah, I mean, you got a little bit of that meat kind of right against the sternum. Um, so on this next side, just focus on like keeping the blade as, as close to that sternum as possible. So, and it's more but it's otherwise, like a straight down cut along the sternum and the backbone. It's not anything correct. angled. Correct. Okay. It goes mostly straight down until you hit that plate. And then that plate will take sort of a slope off to the side. And then do you start from the top by the wishbone again? Or are we starting like in the middle for that process? I like to, I like to start by the top. Okay. Kind of anchoring against that um, breastplate and then just making a sh uh, slice all the way down that entire breastplate. But don't worry about going super deep on the first one. Just kind of using the tip of the knife going in and getting a little bit further in there each time but utilizing the whole length, just not, not worrying about the depth so much on the first one. And then you can always kind of put your thumb down in between the breastplate and the breast and kind of just pull your thumb across and it'll push that breast off a little bit, give you a little bit of extra kind of room to just see things. There's sort of a balance of tactile and visual in butchering. So some of the things you can't see, you have to feel them. It's totally tactile, finding those joints that are hidden. But other times when you can pull the breast away, for example, and you can kind of see where that breastplate is, that also helps a little bit with the, the process. Same kind of thing, just coming in along that wishbone, angled in and down. For now, ignoring it. And then using our hand, our thumb, to kind of just pull everything off of this plate. And then the second one, I think, is always a little harder because you don't have the weight. So the, the carcass starts to move around a little bit more on you. Yeah, it definitely is. And then when we get to the edge of that plate, bringing in the tip of the knife, staying as close to the bone as possible, 
kind of like shallow but long swipes. Staying right along there, kind of following the curvature of the carcass. And one thing about butchering also is if you want to do really, really, really clean um, maximum yield butchery, you're going to be running your knife into bones and stuff sometimes. And the only way around that is you're either an absolute genius and you can, you can clean meat off of the bone without your knife blade coming in contact with the bone, or you just sharpen your knives more often if you're doing something like this. So this one, I even went around, I left a little bit more of the wing meat behind on this side. So I was able, I kind of got the rest of that wing meat off on this swipe. But that's something we'll take off because it's pretty minuscule. And then as soon as you get that second breast separated, you should have just your regular old carcass here. And you know, if you I can think... see through it, bonus points, because that means you got the meat off. I think I left about the same amount of meat on both tries, but it was a lot cleaner on the second one because I was doing right. those longer cuts. The first time I was doing like a two inch cut, a two inch cut, a two inch cut. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. So it's, it's not about going super deep with the cuts, but maintaining any time you can um, in general in butchery, you kind of want to keep your strokes long and smooth. It's, it's like that when you're cutting fish, um, Japanese, like uh, when they're doing sashimi, they've actually say that you can tell the confidence of someone based on the stroke of their knife. And if you have a really nice clean stroke on a piece of fish that you're doing for sashimi, for example, it'll actually leave sort of a glossy, um, almost opalescent film, not a film, but the way it cuts through the proteins, it'll leave this sort of shiny edge where the knife came through. And you can actually tell if someone did a nice confident stroke through the fish. So that's pretty much it. The rest of this is just gonna be, there's some little tiny bits of meat on here. If you really wanna get into it, you can start kind of taking all these little bits and pieces off. Those little bits and pieces can be used for, I mean, at this point, really just like duck sausage. Um, you can do an, a grind, you can chop them up pretty fine and incorporate them into a ragu or a bolognese, anything that you might use beef in, um, ground beef, you can always cut a little bit of this duck in there. And you can more or less seamlessly fold that in. Um, just a little bit of duck if you're going to put it in a preparation where it's cooked fully, it's better to have maybe some duck and beef where you're not going to get just the irony quality of overcooked duck because it definitely starts to taste like iron if it's cooked too much. So last thing we'll do here is kind of uh, show you where we're gonna take this, um, clean up this breast. So you'll see this flap that I got from the wing. I'm gonna come down here where the meat is and keeping my knife angled outwards away from the main meat of the breast, I'm gonna do the same thing, long, shallow strokes. And that's all the, the way flap uh, to be on the right or left side of the breast, is that right? Exactly. It'll be on the outside of the, the breast from whatever um, side you took it from. And then same thing on this one. It's going to be, you'll see some sort of um, connective tissue. It's a little darker where some um, veins and arteries were. And you're going to kind of try and peel those veins, arteries, that connective tissue just away from the nice meat of the breast. Following the outside, just like that. And then if you really want to get involved, you can come in here where this nice long tendon is from the tenderloin, which probably isn't going to show up on your breast. Um, but just as a little aside, you can do that and take that piece of a uh, tendon off because you'll just save yourself from having to chew through that later. Now, does and that then otherwise, look like silver skin or is that? Yes, does... it'll have a nice silvery hue to it. Okay. I think I got like the smallest amount of it. I can see it on the carcass yeah. too. I can see the tendon, but I can see a little bit of silver skin. Right. And then otherwise, it's just how do you want your duck breast to look, you know? So you'll find a little bit of this kind of vasculature like I talked about, sticking the tip of your knife under there. Just kind of come through and pull some of that out. Nobody wants to eat 
a vein or an artery. But don't get too crazy as far as the tenderloin. I would try to leave as much of that attached. Just the head here where it looks like silver skin, like nice beefy connective tissue. You want to just go ahead and take that out. It's just unless you cook it down like we're going to do with the confit, it's just not going to be very nice to eat. So then you'll have a little bit of membrane left here towards the top of the breast, kind of where we got the uh, veins and stuff. And then this just kind of comes down to how much do you want to take off? How clean do you want your duck breast? If I'm going to be doing a duck breast, chances are it's a special occasion. I'm going to want it pretty nice and clean. Just something you can eat the whole, the entirety of the duck breast with. And it's certainly something I'd want in a restaurant, just to have those bits of uh, silver skin and things cleared out. Just makes for a much more pleasant eating experience. And then that tendon, of course, kind of leading into the uh, wing that we cut off. And it's obviously tough and developed because flapping their wings around. You gotta have some pretty serious tendons to do that. So I kind of got a deep artery right here. Which I'm trying to take out. Sometimes it's just a little bit of excavation with those things until it's kind of looking like how you want it to look. And what are your thoughts on like, yeah, I could get all the silver skin off, but I'm taking some meat off. Like, are you more take off as much silver skin as possible, even if, if you're decreasing the yield? So I'm really adamant about the silver skin on the breast just because you're probably going to be cooking this to a medium rare. At least that's, you know, how I like to cook it. And it won't be able to break down at all. And it's just going to be kind of hard to eat. And then what happens is as you're eating it, you just start cutting that stuff away anyway. So you're still going to be losing it. But the yield loss happens later, if that makes sense. It's, um, I've watched, oh man, I got to remember his name. He owns um, Franklin Barbecue. Aaron Franklin, I want to say is his name. Uh, yeah. And he does a lot of trimming up front of the briskets because it becomes somewhat inedible after smoking and it's just something that's going to be lost later on anyway. So he's a little bit utilitarian in that sense. and I kind of tend to agree with that. And then the best thing to do once you kind of have those, the silver skin mostly cleared off, you have your veins um, mostly taken away. And, you know, don't, don't get too crazy on the excavation of the silver skin because you will lead you down a rabbit hole where eventually you have like half a breast left. Um, but just take as much as you can see. But you, no need to kind of chase that seam, if that makes any sense. And then the best thing to do will be um, once you have the silver skin and vasculature all cleared out, You'll flip it over with the meat facing up, skin side down. And then that's when you can kind of trim the fat around it so that you have fat that really just matches up with the breast, but not a big flap, you know, sort of hanging skirt of fat. Okay, so like if I'm looking down at mine right now, I've obviously got the big pieces of fat at the top. Uh, mm -hmm. But as far as like the sides, are you looking for it to be almost like if you went straight down, it's... It's fat meat, or do you want? I a think meat? having a little, having that little skirt is nice. So just like a, you know, sixteenth of an inch of fat around okay, so, the rim so not would be much, pretty ideal. But a little more than than the meat. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I'm gonna take this um, for the camera's sake, right here. I'm gonna take this strip of fat off this side because this was what was on top of the breast plate. And it's just kind of thin and discolored, and it's, I don't think it's going to render out. It'll probably be kind of a funky texture. But any of that really nice, like, bright white fat, that's just going to render out and be super delicious. Definitely got to be okay with fat for eating duck. Yeah. <laughs> and then here on my particular breast, for example, you'll see I kind of have this flap on the side. That's just really, really thin meat. 
So because that's such a thin piece, that's from where I went underneath the ribs. I'll kind of cut that off at an angle. And lo and behold, it makes both of my breasts the same shape. So my breast will have sort of a more rectangular shape up top and then this little sort of tapered point down to one side. That's gonna be your maximum, maximum use. So what I have is, oh, go ahead. Was that trim you made at the very tip, just just so it's not so thin on this end? Yeah, because if you're gonna have, you know, meat that's only an eighth of an inch thick or so, it's just gonna overcook and it's gonna be the chewier stuff that was closer to the ribs anyway. So, so it's just not gonna be super how tasty. How much would you take off here? So I would just take off that kind of extra chunk of fat, but that point is gonna be pretty nice. Okay, so really keep all that meat, just cut a piece of yeah. fat off. Okay. Mine I had um, basically a full rectangle shape because I had taken a little extra from underneath the ribs on the one of my two breasts. And then do you have your um, pre-butchered breasts available? I don't have them available. I got them I'm gonna as, show it to the camera. I got them as backups in case this went horribly wrong on my end. But yeah. You're really good at this, so I'm saving those for another meal. Oh yeah, you'll get a nice one out of it. Make a little duck a l'orange. Something super classic. So then what's gonna end up happening is I'm just gonna show y'all kind of what my breast looks like versus what the pre-butchered breast looks like. So there's the difference. Mine has the taper. They seem to cut a little bit more of the tip of their duck breast off. Um, I have a little bit more fat around the outside of my duck breast here. Whereas this kind of is just one of those straight down cuts, sort of like you were talking. And um, I've cleaned all the silver skin off this pre sort of butchered one. They're gonna take whole muscles and this is just true of anything. They take all those whole muscles and then you still need a little bit of cleaning work on your end just because the labor and everything it would take to have someone in here delicately cleaning all these wouldn't, wouldn't make any sense for the cost of the duck breast. They'd have to jack it up so chef, if you want to give some feedback on mine, mostly on just like the the amount of fat I left. Um, yeah. Because I don't want to take too this much. It's looking off. nice. It looks like steak, doesn't it? Yeah. No, I was. This uh, looks like really nice pieces of. Um, when I reached out the to camera, duck, almost duck looks like filet. about uh, about partnering together for this class, I was like, I was kind of surprised. These are like, these are steak like duck breasts. And I mean, these ducks are huge. Oh, so yeah. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the biggest ducks I've ever actually used. I'm used to a little bit smaller bird than this. So these are going to be, you could, you could basically split, you know, you can split one of these really, have either two meals or share one with your significant other or what have you. If you were to split so, it, would you I'm, just go lengthwise? I would probably just sear the entire thing. And then when it came down to actually cutting it, sear the entire thing and then just kind of do slices all the way down. The hardest one, the one steak, the one muscle I sort of split lengthwise is a ribeye, just because if you take, you know, right half versus left half, someone's gonna get all the spinalis. And I just think that that's unfair because it's the best part of the cow in my opinion. So last thing I'm just gonna sort of point out, I'm not gonna do it for this purpose. If you take the duck, uh, the leg and thigh, we can pretty much leave all of this fat for the confit. If there's a big tip here where it's just fat, like a big point, you can take that point off because it'll be a little bit hard to consume after the cook but you can still leave the majority of the fat on there. Just taking like the large um, pieces around the edge. Okay, so I had that large piece of the tip and then what about this 
this part. Oh, sorry. So you can see. You good? This part. Yeah, here, I would take I that I, flap right there. Okay, because I know there's some meat there, so just be careful to just take the fat. Yeah. Okay. Just take as much fat as possible. Um, at least when it's just a large, large piece like that. And then I don't, for confit, I don't actually separate the leg and thigh. I just keep them together. And I'm just going to show the camera real quick and then I'll show you because it's something you kind of have to get up close and personal with. If you are going to separate a leg and thigh, it takes kind of this L shape here between these two bones. The best way to find where that joint is, is there's this little bit of intramuscular fat here and you can see it forms a line. If you go right in that line, you'll go right into the joint that separates the leg and the thigh. It makes it much, much easier than trying to kind of feel or blind. Is that like right it. here? Yeah, so if you're looking, I'm just gonna show you real quick. If you're looking here, uh -huh. you see this kind of fat that forms this little, in, it's really kind of in oh, the muscle there. I see, yeah. And if you push down kind of where that fat is with your thumb, you can actually feel that joint. If you go right in that line, pretty much every time you'll get right into that joint. So we're just gonna clean up the last leg and thigh here. And then we will start the cure. And if you're a fan of the classics, you can listen to the cure while you make the cure. We don't have that kind of budget, so. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the copyright license for that. And you'll kind of see too, I mean, this is just so much fat that you can render out and use for things. The cool thing is, is that once you sort of confit a duck, um, you can, it sounds, it sounds weird. People don't necessarily always like this idea, but you can really recycle that fat. So once you confit your duck, um, if you heat that fat up, strain it out, so you're getting any bits of leftover spices or things like that, little globs of fat that came off of the duck, you can freeze that fat and then you can use it the next time you confit. I wouldn't necessarily do that indefinitely, but you could probably get two or three batches of confit and then you're gonna have something that's higher in duck fat. So assuming you're starting with lard, for example, you'll have something that's higher in duck fat and you'll also have something that's already got some good flavor in it. So it kind of just compounds that flavor over time. I'm a fan of doing that with stocks as well. You make a stock, you use that stock to make something, maybe you're braising something in it, then you strain that stock out, freeze it, and then you use that in the base of the next stock that you make, if you're making the same stock. And it just keeps on going. And there, at least on my end, that's all, well, this didn't come from this duck, this is from another duck. But there's all of our pieces. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I don't think I did butcher a duck. Yeah. Well, congratulations. I think uh, th this is one of the hardest ones to kind of do, uh, especially when you're not butchering stuff every day. So duck is a little bit more difficult. It, in, in theory, you hear duck, chicken, how can it be that different? I think you can probably attest to this now. It's quite a bit different than chicken. So we're going to go ahead and move on to... Um, getting a cure down on our duck confit legs. I like to go ahead and throw my neck in my confit because it's just another one of those really tasty snacks. And then we'll start getting on the cure for one of our duck breasts to make a duck prosciutto, which is a lot less intimidating than it sounds. <laughs>